Hey y'all, and welcome to SneakCon. My name is Omar Kimbaya, Senior Solutions Engineer at Sneak, and today I'm gonna to be talking to you all about the Secure Developer's Desktop. What does it mean, and what are some tools that we can use in order to become more secure developers? So before we kind of dive into it, I wanna kind of explain what a secure developer is. So a developer normally is somebody that has very tight deadlines, that has a lot of different things in their backlogs, and they're trying to deliver software as quickly as possible. A developer isn't necessarily a security expert, and neither is a secure developer. So in order for a developer to become a secure developer, they need to be able to use tools to augment that part of them. They need something they can say, this is something that is gonna be my security expert, and I'm gonna focus on this in order for me to deliver better and more secure code on a timely basis. That's kind of like the main difference here. One developer doesn't use tooling and has inherent trust in open source and their own coding abilities and delivers software on time, but that software isn't necessarily checked for any sort of vulnerabilities. Whereas a secure developer cares about the, the state of their application and also the state of the open source depends that they're using, as well as the containers and the infrastructure that are all surrounding their application. So to kind of move forward with this then, we wanna be able to look at a couple of things. So first, what are some tools that we can use to look at dependency health? If I wanna import a new dependency into my project, what sort of tools can I use in order to identify that? And then moving into dependency vulnerabilities, let's see what we can uh, identify within our project and what we can remediate. Code scanning, so more of a SAST perspective, but with a twist. This SAST is developer-centric. And how does that happen? I'll show you later on. But it, uh, the idea is to, for us to be able to do SAST on our own machines and to be able to identify where we are introducing vulnerabilities. So that way, whenever we deliver our software, it doesn't have any vulnerabilities that we've written in. We've identified them and we've taken care of them even before they've went off to production. And then container scanning, how are we deploying our applications? And then infrastructure as code scanning. We wanna know if the configuration that we have for our cloud, we wanna make sure that that is going to be secure as well and follows best practices. So what we'll do is we're in Sneak Advisor. And the first thing we wanna do is we want to introduce a new package into our application. So this new package is gonna be React. We want to create a, a, a better front-end experience and we want it to you know, work with our teams and our team is pretty well versed in React, so let's go ahead and do that. So I wanna know a couple of things. What are some vulnerabilities or known vulnerabilities with React? What is the community like and can I expect React to be pretty well supported as time goes on? So here with Sneak Advisor, I can look at things from NPM, from PyPy, from Docker, and of course we're gonna be adding in other ones as well, like Ruby and Go mods, things like that in nature. But for now, since I'm looking at NPM, I'm gonna go ahead and do a search for React. Now a couple things here. I can see that React, of course, this last one was published five months ago, and it has a uh, package health score of 93 out of 100. That seems pretty, I feel pretty good about that, pretty confident about it. There's the other ones though, like this React.js one and re-act, uh, these aren't necessarily very popular it seems. Um, and probably they might be malicious or they might be forks, could be anything, but their package health score seems to be pretty low and the last time they were published was years ago. So in the software development world, five years and four years ago is pretty much the dinosaur ages. I don't wanna touch that. This one was last updated five months ago. That seems pretty good. So let's go ahead and look into this one. So here I can see the package health score, I can see the popularity, I can see the maintenance and security and community. I can see all these things are pretty positive. And if I'm looking at other packages maybe, maybe I can use Vue instead of React. It has a higher score, just saying. And Angular, mm, the score isn't as high, but Angular does have a lot of different versions. So this might not be the, the same Angular. I don't know, I'd have to click into test it out. But down here, I can see that React is very popular, like tens, like millions of downloads every single week. Maintenance is pretty strong. There's a lot of commits throughout time. And security, I can see that there are, you know, there's a few vulnerabilities in here, but they're from earlier versions, and there's no new vulnerabilities in the current version right now. So that makes me feel pretty good that they do care a lot about security for the framework. So then any sort of security issues that I introduce through my project, it's not necessarily React's fault, 
It's my fault. Hmm. Makes you think, doesn't it? But anyways, I also know it's an MIT license, and my company allows me to use the MIT license, so I'm pretty happy about that. Okay, so I want to use React. I want to put this into my project. So let's switch over to the IDE, and let's look at the project. All right, here I am in my IDE. Now, I'm. this is IntelliJ. This is a JetBrains product, and Sneak does have support for all of JetBrains products. I uh, have support for VS Code, Visual Studio, as well as Eclipse, and a couple of other IDEs as well. So we, we cover a lot of ground here. Now, since I'm using IDEA, it's not necessarily a JavaScript-centric IDE, I know, but I can still write JavaScript here and have a pretty good experience. That's, that's what I'm using it for now. Uh, right now, I'm looking at my users.js, you know, just adding routes and, you know, adding ways that we can add new users and remove new users, all that good stuff. And of course, here's my package.json. So right off the bat, with our integration with JetBrains, you can see that these advisor scores, like I showed you earlier, are shown here. And I can see that a lot of these are either average or way below average or even failing. So that's not necessarily confidence inducing for the state of the open source uh, dependencies I have within my project. Mm, not too great, right? So what I wanna do is I wanna go ahead and get a better idea of what vulnerabilities do I have with the, the open source dependencies that are uh, uh, here? And also, are there any vulnerabilities in transient level um, dependencies with these dependencies here? I'm gonna say dependencies a lot in this video, so just prepare yourself for that. All right, so there's a little sneak button here, and allow me to do three things. So the one I wanna care about right now is open source security, but then we will talk about code security and code quality. And the key thing here I want you to be able to identify is how quickly this happens. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit this play button. And of course, while this is scanning, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you about my summer vacation. You know, my wife and, okay. Well, I guess the summer vacation talk is gonna to have to hold off for a while because there we go. We got results, ladies and gentlemen, and it was pretty freaking fast. Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? You guys know I'm right, right? Yeah. Okay. So I want to look at Kerberos first and foremost. So Kerberos 0024, there's a deal injection in that. And this is actually coming from Mongoose 424. Hmm. So I'm not using Kerberos directly, but Kerberos is being used by Mongoose or a dependency of Mongoose or a dependency of a dependency of Mongoose. So in this case, it comes from Mongoose, MongoDB, MongoDB Core, and then it's using Kerberos 0024. That's a pretty early version of, of Kerberos, and there is a DL injection in there. But how do I fix this? I can't upgrade Kerberos. Uh, I mean, I could, but that could potentially break MongoDB Core, which will break MongoDB, then which will break Mongoose. What's the point? So now I have a decision to make. I can look at the remediation here, which is really the only decision I should make at this point, and that's to upgrade Mongoose to 425. That's pretty simple. All I have to do is change this from a, uh, from a four to a five, and boom, I'm done. Like I am, I have taken care of this vulnerability. It is that simple. So now that I know how to take care of this in a very quick and easy way, I have more confidence that the open source dependencies that I'm introducing or using in my projects are not adding more holes or um, exploitable weaknesses in my application later on when it hits production. But what about the stuff that I'm introducing? Like me as an individual, what am I doing wrong here? What are some ways that I can improve my own code from a security perspective? Well, I can look at code security here. And I have a couple of options in here. So I'm gonna look at this SQL injection first and foremost and get a better sense of what's going on there. And what I can see is that very quickly it opens up the index.js file so I can see in my code where the actual vulnerability is and also step through it. That's interesting. So there's a data flow here and the data flow essentially means where the data comes in to my code base and then where the data goes out. So my source and then my sync. For all, of the, for all of you out there who are very familiar with SAS tooling, that sort of terminology is probably very familiar to you. For a lot of the developers, may not be so. So they don't really understand the, the source and the sync, but if I explain it to them, hey, it makes a lot of sense, right? So in between my source and my sync, 
Am I doing any sort of validation? Am I doing any sort of sanitization? What sort of things am I doing with that data? And then where am I executing that data? Where's that data going? In this case, data is coming in from a request body. Okay, I'm just I'm, I'm accepting the request body. That makes sense. User sends like submit something, and hey, I, I should do something with that. And then I'm immediately taking in the username and password from that request body. Hmm. So I'm not doing anything special here. I'm not. I'm not checking for anything. I'm just saying, hey, whatever you give me, I will go ahead and execute that. So if someone does do something nefarious or puts in some fuzzy input or something that I'm not expecting, I am putting that into a query directly. That's not great. And I don't want to be able to do that. That seems like a bad idea. So how do I fix this? How do I address this problem? Well, I'm glad you asked me because right here we have three different example fixes that I can use as inspiration to fix this particular issue. And these examples come from multiple projects that have open source projects in particular that have addressed this particular issue before. So that is really good. So I can learn from the open source community without actually leaving my IDE. That's a pretty cool, that's a pretty cool service. I, I kind of like that. I like to stay where my code is, where my focus is, because when I go into a browser, I lose that focus. If I if I lose the focus from what I'm doing. I, I lose my train of thought. And if I lose my train of thought, where was I going with this? Oh, that's right. If I lose my train of thought, then I end up producing something that is not high quality. You see what I did there? You see what I did there? I'm glad you do. Okay, let's look at code quality then. What does this tell me? So looking at this one on index.js on line 62, I see I'm using some sort of regex expression. And it's saying here that this may be improved to handle different new lines. That's fair, that's fine. I can do that if that's something that I'm concerned about. You know, I can make my code better. Thank you, code quality check for allowing me to make my code better. Uh, so in a sense, this helps me become a better developer. It gives me different ideas. I can choose to do it or choose not to. It doesn't make me more uh, or less of a secure developer. But what it does do is just make me a better developer. So I'm able to see open source dependencies and I'm able to see open source vulnerabilities in those dependencies. And I'm also able to see the, the vulnerabilities I'm introducing with my code. So this is all really good and really strong. So the next question is, if I make all these changes and if I change all this stuff and I'm ready to deploy, how am I deploying this? And what sort of vulnerabilities am I introducing with my deployment method? Let's kind of let's let's take a look at containers and infrastructure as code. All right. So here I am in my terminal in my IDE. Again, I don't like context switching. I like to stay in one place. And I already have two tabs open that have a container scan, IAC scan. So with movie magic, I've kind of done things already ahead of time. So with my container scan initially, I ran this command here. Sneak container test and then the container that I already have built. So here what I can see uh, right off the bat is like I have 900 issues in my container. That's a lot. That's introducing a whole heap of trouble into my production environment. Mm, I don't think security is gonna be too happy about that. So what I can see here is that the base image of node 1410, which is the version I'm using right now, has 900 vulnerabilities and 46 of them are critical, but, if I change it up by using a later version of Node, uh, a minor version, then I can reduce that a little by a little more than than half or a little less than half. That's pretty good. I mean, I like the odds of that. And then, you know, by three quarters, I only have ten critical vulnerabilities. I like that. But what if I make a major version change? What will that do? Well, I'll have three hundred forty-nine vulnerabilities, and four of them are critical. That's a lot easier to manage than 900, but do I have other options? Well, yeah, I have alternative base images that I can use that are all open source. I can use a slimmer version of Node, I can use the Bullseye Slim or the Buster Slim, or just straight up Buster. And the one that's straight up Buster doesn't give me too much difference, but it does give me less critical vulnerabilities. But this one, the Bullseye Slim, 38 vulnerabilities, two of them are critical. I can manage that. 
I can spend a good afternoon working on that and, and making that less so. And so I can put in my uh, code inside that container and start running it and I, I'm feeling pretty confident, I'm pretty good to go. So I can scroll up here and take a look at all the different you know, vulnerabilities that I have in here, but really my solution is just to change the base image and have a base image that has less vulnerabilities that I need to deal with. This is something that I would wanna do in, in conjunction with maybe a security team or a security person, you know, kind of like bounce back ideas on, you know, what is a better container, or if there's another team or another person that deals with this, like kind of like tell them, these are the things that I need in this container. And, um, you know, here's just some ideas for a base images that we could potentially use. Um, but this is like a version of it. So let's go ahead and make that change. So there's a lot of different things that we can do with this information that allows it to be collaborative within our teams, but also just make us more secure whenever code is, is living and breathing inside of this container image. That's pretty great. So let's say for example then, I do have my container deployed in some sort of cloud infrastructure. Well, how am I securing that cloud infrastructure? Well, probably by a million different ways or, or a few ways, but if I'm using something like Terraform or I'm using something like Kubernetes uh, or if I'm using Helm charts for my Kubernetes clusters, you know, what are some ways for me to identify some issues or misconfigurations that will, you know, help me be a better infrastructure as coder, I guess. I don't think anyone says that, but maybe they should. Let's take a look at that real quick. So I have some results here. Again, movie magic. It's pretty fantastic. That's that's an, that's an intentional rhyme, if you got the time. Now, what we see here is that if I ran sneak IC test, IC main.tf, so I have uh, my Terraform files within this uh, project as well. When I ran that, I was able to get this information really, really quick. So there's a high issue that basically says credentials are configured via provider attributes. Okay, I can make a change. Uh, I am password should, lower, uh, should contain lowercase characters. Okay, I can make these changes. And I know exactly where these things are too because it's all gonna be within this main.tf file and that kind of helps me. And if I have a bunch of more files like this, Sneak is gonna tell me where those, file, those issues are within those files. So that makes things pretty, pretty simple. So now I have a better idea on my containers and on my infrastructure as code. Now let's say for example, I'm just ready to push everything over to GitHub. What is that going to look like? And what are some things that I can do within GitHub from, you know, from my desktop to GitHub that will help me become a more secure developer? Let's take a look at that now. Okay, so it's code review time and I want to be able to look at all of my issues within one place. So here I am in the sneak user interface. I'm looking at my goof project that's imported from GitHub and you know, let's just kind of take a look at what we have here. And a lot of this information is gonna be the same information that I got inside of my IDE. The kicker here though, is if I do this, if I fix the vulnerability, it's gonna give me a view that's gonna look like this. And so the idea is that I can pick and choose whichever one of these I want, and I can go ahead and deal with them. So in this case, I have that Kerberos vulnerability that we talked about earlier, and that was to upgrade Mongoose from 424 to 425. So if I go ahead and hit that open a fix PR, that's gonna open up this guy. And this is in my GitHub repository. And what I can see here is that within my repo, I have a lot of different information. So I have everything that I need to know in order to identify what should I do with this. And of course, if I look at the um, files changed, we're changing two files, package.json and package.lock.json. But more specifically, we're just upgrading Mongoose from 424 to 425, pretty simple. Coming back to conversation then, uh, I can see the priority score, you know, why is this a serious thing and, and how should I prioritize this? I can see the issue, is this a breaking change? No, thank goodness. And then of course the exploit maturity. Is there an exploit for this? Right now, there's not an, uh, one that's available. Cool. Here's another thing that we can do. So Sneak, as you can see, has these different checks. So it'll do a license check for me. It'll do a security check for me. And what we can also do is a code scanning check. So in the event that I wanna push new code to my Git repository, I'll be able to see if, if I'm adding any new dependencies to it 
on do those dependencies have issues? Do they have license issues that are not compliant with my organization? And code scanning, am I introducing vulnerabilities with my new code pull request? In this case, no, 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 I am perfectly good. Let's go ahead and merge this and fix that Kerberos vulnerability. Now everybody go ahead and rebase and we should be good to go, right? For this vulnerability, yes. For the other ones, uh, let's do this process all over again and let's iterate and iterate and iterate and iterate and iterate and let's get to the point where we all together can become more secure developers. So we talked about a lot of different things. These things really line up to the products that we have at Sneak. So Dependency Health, free tool, anyone can use Sneak Advisor, that's there for you. Dependency Vulnerabilities, Sneak Open Source, also a free tool that you can use. Code scanning with Sneak Code, a free tool that you can use and you can see where your code is uh, vulnerable. Container scanning, infrastructure is code scanning. Are you seeing a theme? Because I'm seeing a theme, and these two are also free for you to use and see how these things work. So I definitely encourage you to download Sneak and try it out. See what you can find in your code bases and become a better and more secure developer. And of course, SneakCon is happening and it's very exciting. There's a lot of great talks. But if you wanna hear it from me, here are the ones that I think you should check out. So you're a secure developer, but you have a particular ecosystem that you're within. So Python, Java, Go, Node.js, we have all these different developer talks, check them out. CICD best practices, check that out. Secure containers easily with base image management, we talked a little bit about that. If you want more details, we have a talk about that. Secure Terraform deployments, also have some there we can talk about. And there's so much more here at SnakeCon. But ultimately, what you wanna be and what you wanna do is become a better and more secure developer. And we can help you with that. So thank you all for listening, and I can't wait to talk to y'all more here at SneakCon. This has been Omar, signing off. Yeah.